I guess I should have known since it's based on a YA novel that has a pretty large following that it would be something, but you know, there's so many Netflix movies. Fia Alvarez is a playwright, screenwriter, and former nanny who grew up here in Baltimore and now lives in a converted chocolate factory in Brooklyn. She stopped by the studio on a trip home to discuss her book-filled childhood split between Mayfield and Greektown and the Netflix hit To All the Boys I've Loved Before, which she adapted and wrote. And fans of the movie might be interested to know she just finished the sequel, which she wrote on maternity leave. Fia is cool and talented, and even though we've been friends for 15 years, she still surprises me. Oh, I got Pinot Grigio. That's why this is disgusting. Mm, it's all right. Whatever. What are you drinking these days? Are you drinking? I am. Well. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've been drinking a lot of red wine. I've also been weirdly drinking. There's a bar right next to our house, and, like, the two times we've gone to, like, have dinner there, I've weirdly wanted, like, a whiskey sour. And they make a really good whiskey sour, but it a little bit makes me think it's something that someone who, like, doesn't drink yet orders. Yeah. <laughs> I ordered a mojito when I was, like, 18 in college, and it came out, and I was like, oh, no, like, this isn't right. Like, it has seaweed or something in it. And they were like, can we see your ID? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think a whiskey, a whiskey sour, a mojito. Yeah, it's like you're yeah. 16, and you're like, what, what's a drink? Yeah, like a margarita at, like, yeah. an Italian restaurant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Those are the telltale signs. Um, so I was thinking about this interview, and it occurs to me, you are not the first brunette, Bryn Mawr graduate, playwright with a well-known father in the arts that I have interviewed. Oh, that's right, because you interviewed Miranda Hall, right? Yes, yeah. And I was like, I got to diversify my portfolio, Mm -hmm. but I'm glad you're here. At least we didn't go to the same college. (laughs) That's true. I don't think she went to Bennington. No, she (laughs) did That would have been really weird. Yeah. I think she was in New York now, too. Oh, yeah. She just had a show in New York that I really wanted to go see, but it was happening when I was nine months pregnant. So I emailed her and was like, sorry. Yeah. That's a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. But he's out now. Yes, he is. Beautiful Gus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's in Baltimore for his second time? He's on his second trip to Baltimore. He was here for Christmas, and now he's back again. What does he think? He loves it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Returning to his home city. Well, Loves returning to his mother's home city. city. Loves seeing his grandparents and his great-grandparents. They're all here. Mm -hmm. They never left, right? Everybody stayed. My mom moved to New York uh, for a couple of years after I graduated from college, and... Then she moved back to Baltimore. And my dad moved to L.A. for like five years when I was in college and then moved back to Baltimore. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. And that's where your sister lives. That's where my sister lives. And your brother's in New York? He's in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Okay. It's like I don't know where all the Alvarez is. (laughs) We're all over the place. (laughs) Um, So you've had a pretty big year. I have. Yeah. So besides the human baby, you had a Netflix baby. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? Because I didn't. I, th- I didn't really know what was going on. And then suddenly, like, your name was everywhere. And I was so excited for you. Yeah, that was pretty wild. I mean, I guess I should have known since it's based on a YA novel that has a pretty large following that it would be something. But, you know, there's so many Netflix movies and you never know which one is going to pop. Yeah. Like, some of them just kind of they go into the scroll and yeah. <laughs> no one really sees them. So I was obviously thrilled because this is the first movie I'd ever written that was produced. Um, so I was really happy it was coming out, but at the same time, I'd say my expectations were very tempered okay. in terms of, like, what I expected. Yeah. And then... And we should say, this is To All the Boys I've Loved Before, which you adapted. I adapted from Jenny Han's novel. Yes. And how? what was the process of, of that? I mean, did you... Were you chosen to do that? Did you uh, yes. ask to do that? Well, so I was in New York, and I was working on this play of mine, Friend Art, that went up at second stage. And I had previously been working on this show, Man Seeking Woman, that was a Simon Ritz show that was on FXX. And I had written for that show for two seasons. And then the third season of that was set to start the writer's room at the exact same time I was starting rehearsals for Friend Art. Ah. And so I had to, like, make a call and while I loved working on Man Seeking Woman and loved working for Simon Rich, uh, I just had to do the play because I, like, have wanted to be a playwright since I was a little kid. And it was my first New York production, which is something I'd been, you know, working towards, dreaming about, et cetera, from the time I moved to New York at that point, like, 10 years before. So I left my TV job to do the play. And then I was in rehearsals for the play. I guess we were actually already in preview performances. And since I'd quit my TV job, I was just available <laughs> 
And I got an email from one of my film agents that said, there's this book. They're looking for someone to adapt it. We've attached the novel. Take a read. Let us know what you think. And if you like it, we can set up a pitch for you. So I read the book. I fell in love with it. I just thought it was so cute and warm and like a great high school love story, Mm -hmm. which who doesn't like those? Yeah. So I flew to L.A. when the play closed and wrote a pitch for the movie went in, pitched for it, and just got it. So it was a pretty straightforward, oh like... They're, like, waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, well, me and a bunch of other people, and then thankfully they picked me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it wasn't, you know, there was... I guess the fact that I got it's pretty magical, but other than that, it's, like, the way the industry kind of works at its most basic level. Yeah. Like, <laughs> through your agents, right. do you want to pitch for it? Yeah. Come in. Um, and then I wrote it. I really liked the producers I worked with, uh, who was this company, Awesomeness TV, And they're now at Paramount. Um, And so worked with them on writing it for about a year on and off. And then they decided they filmed it. And then it was really cool because I got to go in. I didn't go to set, but I did go into the edit room. And that was the first time I'd done that on a movie Mm -hmm. because so much of TV and film is, like, written in the editing room. So I, like, rewrote all the VO, the voiceover when I was there. Um, How did you approach – so I think – the adapting is so interesting. Um, I took a class in college where we adapted. We just were told to choose a novel and adapt mm-hmm. it. And we had like 30 pages to do it. So obviously a lot got cut. Um, but uh, it was one of my favorite projects that I worked on in college. I thought it was – I had to be ruthless and super creative and like kind of cunning. And it just exercised all of like the writerly parts of yeah. my brain. Um, and I just I, – you probably know Augustine Burroughs. television mm-hmm. his – only novel, I think, because others are more memoirs. Um, and it's like this super bitchy book. So mm-hmm. it, was, it was like a, a really like warm, happy experience. So, But it was hard. So I'm yeah. wondering, how did you approach – I mean, what did you – how did you choose what to cut? Like, where were, you, where were you ruthless? Where did things stand out that you knew you needed to keep? Well, so I took a lot – there are three books in this series of To All the Boys I Loved Before – and for the first movie, I took a lot from the first book, but I also took a lot from the second book. I read a review that said that. <laughs> yeah, because the first book sort of ends in the middle of the story. Um, and so I'm actually writing the sequel, the second movie right now. And since I've used so much of the second book in the first movie, I'm actually having to like really be creative again and how I'm now going to adapt this one. But uh, I think... W- a mistake I've made before in adapting, trying to adapt a novel was reading the novel too many times mm. uh, because then I think you get so sort of like addicted to the book form. And when doing the screenplay version, you have to like maintain the heart of the story but simplify it and not lose any of the depth. So like you're saying, it's a pretty challenging puzzle. And when you read the book too many times, you just – I think are too attached to the book story and you can't do you just don't have the real estate to put everything in a book into the movie you have to really like pick and choose and so with these what I would do was I still spent a significant amount of time with the novels but before making my outline or before going in and saying like these are the key parts of the story I would only read the book a couple of times whereas I think this other book I tried to adapt I would read the book like I think like 10 times and was like how am I going to do it and was just trying to make like an exact replica and that screenplay ended up being like unsuccessful I think because it was like well this is not the book like Mm -hmm. if you want the book you should read the book, which I, as a big reader, I'm like, the book's always better. Right. Um, and I was trying to do that too much. And so for these, I would read the book and then be like, what are the key parts? Like, what do we really need to get the feel of this story? And then you end up losing, like, a lot of really good material, but you can sort of try to make up for that by letting what you do keep in, like, really hit. Like, mm-hmm. make sure you give the scenes that – you've decided to maintain their full punch factor. Like that hot tub scene in the movie. That was really like, okay, we're keeping that scene. Yep. And so let's give it like as much as we possibly have. Yeah. And then I, I also would try to combine certain elements if they're both important, but you don't have room for both. Like in the book, can I talk about like things that happen in the movie as a way of explaining the adaptation? Sure. Is that okay? Man. Yeah. If you haven't uh, seen the movie already, stop listening to this podcast. Yeah. Go watch the movie. <laughs> And come back. <laughs> so in the book, uh, 
Well, there's this scene in the movie where the guy shows how much he cares for our main, our heroine, Laura Jean, because he he brings her these Korean yogurts that she really likes in the scene where they're like making out in the hot tub. They talk about that. In the book, it's that he had gotten up early to get her these like little chocolate covered donuts that they'd gotten once on a trip to an antique store where the, the place opens really early and he went and got them. But we didn't have room for that antique scene. We didn't have room for the chocolate covered donuts. But also in the book, she brings the Korean yogurts to school and he asked her little sister to bring them one. So I was like, we can combine those two things and get the exact same feeling yeah. of him, you know, going to get her the donuts, but just use the Korean yogurt, which we know we want to put in and have already planted. So there are just little like puzzles like that yeah. you can do on a very basic level. Um, but then there's also the more complicated stuff of like, oh, what if we don't put in the fact that she made out with the other guy in the first movie, which happens in the book. But I just, the movie was so much less about that relationship and so much more about the love story between her and Peter, the main guy, that we thought that's an okay thing to lose, even though it's such a huge part of the book. Yeah. It just didn't, wasn't essential for the story we were trying to tell in the movie. But those are hard calls. Sure. And when you're working through all these puzzles, do you ever think about what the author of the the novel is think would think or, or Of course. Yeah. Like I think that the the problem with this other book that's not to all the boys that I was talking about adapting is I had the writer not not truly in my head because we weren't talking, but I just had her like on my shoulder and was thinking, I don't want to disappoint her. Mm -hmm. Like she wrote this book, I wanna honor it. And that ended up being like my downfall whereas with this one I didn't end up meeting Jenny until after I'd already written the screenplay and while I wished that I'd been in communication with her while I was writing it I actually think it was good because I had to just think about it in terms of being a screenplay first yeah um and then she thinks of it she likes it okay I'm, and thank God uh because yeah. you always want the author to be happy but if you're too worried about the author you can't do your job. How much can you tell us about the adaptation of the next? Of the next book. Yeah. Uh, well, what I can tell you is that um, John Ambrose McLaren, who has the character who shows up at the end of To All the Boys 1 in the credits, comes back in the sequel. That was the one letter that went unanswered in the first movie. So I think we're going to be seeing a little bit of a love triangle between oh Laura Jean and Peter and John. And... Yeah, uh, where the first movie um, was a lot about, you know, I've I've never had a boyfriend. What would it be like to have a boyfriend? I'm scared of everything surrounding leading up to love. The second movie is a little bit digging into once you're in a relationship and in love, what does that mean? How does that change? Especially you know, when you're 17. Especially when you're 17. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah. I think it's worth noting that you're writing this on your maternity leave. <laughs> I am writing it on my maternity leave. How has that been? So it's the fastest I've ever written a screenplay, and I have a newborn. So that was a challenge. I think part of me just, like, blacked out and wrote it. Um, <laughs> I'm lucky that I have a lot of help. Like, you know, my husband is great. Uh, we have, like, a real partnership in terms of, like, parenting. And then his parents came down. My mom came up. We have a nanny. Uh, so, yeah, it's – we've done it, but it's been <laughs> – Because we were texting a little bit, I think, right after Gus yeah. was born. And you were on deadline? Yes. And you you hit your deadline somehow. I've been on deadline twice. Twice. I oh had two God. deadlines in six weeks. I made both of them. <laughs> but it was – it was hard. Oh, yeah. my God. So what are you doing? Like, what phase are you in now? I just handed in my second draft. Okay. So uh, we're filming um, this winter. So I'll do I'll do some more work on it before it's filmed. But The bulk of it's... The big ones are done. Oh, my gosh. Like, so there is a screenplay that exists. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So what do you do now? I mean, what's what role do you have in this? And then also, like, what else is going on for you? So in this, I'll continue to be involved through production, um, in writing, but then also I'll go to set, uh, you know. And then apart from that, the thing that I'm working on right now that I'm very excited about is another thing I did on my maternity leave was I launched a theater company. I didn't know that. Yeah. What? On your maternity leave also? Well, it was in the works ahead of time, and then it just 
so happens that, you know, you get pregnant and then that baby's coming and you got this other stuff going on and I still needed to do it. So uh, this I have this plain nylon that is going up at Theater Lab in New York and we start rehearsals in February and then our first performance is March 6th and we run March 6th through March 24th. And that's under the banner of this theater company, BTP, that I started with my friend Nicola Korzenko, who... What a I great met. Name. Yeah, she's wonderful. She and I met when I first moved to New York. I worked in the theater department of Creative Artist Agency, which is one of like the big agencies, and so did she. We were hired within a week of one another, and I was an assistant to an agent who repped playwrights and directors, and she was an assistant to an agent who repped actors. And then I left after like a year and a half because I was like. I don't want to be an agent. I want to be a playwright. I've always wanted to be a playwright. And she stayed longer and became a junior agent, but then sort of was called to the tech world, which apart from theater is like her other love. Uh, And then she worked in venture capital for a while. Then she went to Harvard Business School. And now she works at Amazon. And so we decided to create this theater company. So her name and her like resume yeah. are both She's got a very, a very impressive resume. And so I was like, be my producing partner. <laughs> uh, and we started this theater company called BTP, which stands for the Blockchain Theater Project. The, the idea is that we would use cryptocurrency to fund playwrights who want to self-produce their plays. And that the playwright of each production would choose the, the next production. They would nominate a play of their peers because I think that playwrights know better than anyone else what the best plays being written are because they're the ones in writer's groups. They're the ones who are teaching. They're the ones who are going to all of these readings. Sure. And so you don't need to waste money on development. You could just say like, hey, I have like 30 playwriting friends, playwright friends, and I know what all of their best plays are that should have been produced <laughs> And so we want to do those. And also I think there's this idea that playwrights are very competitive with one another because there aren't enough slots. And it's true that there aren't enough slots, but in my experience, we're not super competitive because we want to be. Everyone's, like, very supportive. You're so, not, like, cutthroat. You're just yeah, trying to get exactly. your shit shown. Yeah. Everyone's trying to get their play up, but it's not because they want they don't want their peers to succeed. It's just because there aren't a lot of slots. Mm-hmm. So this was a way to, like, showcase that. How's the cryptocurrency part going? So the cryptocurrency part, I mean, I think we, if you know about cryptocurrencies, then you know that they're not really in a great spot at the moment. (laughs) But when we conceived of the idea, we were like, oh, there's so much money in crypto. And the same people get hit up for theater funding all the time. So if there's, like, new money out there that people don't necessarily know what to do with, maybe they should give it to us so Mm -hmm. we can produce theater. And then... In the time since we've had the idea and, like, our play was about to go up, <laughs> cryptos have really nosedived. So we also take donations in traditional USD. <laughs> is there a website you want to plug There right is now? a website I'd love to plug. <laughs> it's btproject.us. Um, but, yeah, so I think we both believe in in crypto long term. And, you know, our name of our theater company that was chosen a while ago is the Blockchain Theater Project. <laughs> We call it BTP a lot more now sure. than we did sure. six months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but so you know. much has changed in Gus's short life. <laughs> yeah, so much has changed. So, you know, we'll see on the, the tech side. But I think on the theater side, it's still a mission that we, like, really believe in. And Nylon is hopefully the first of many productions in this chain. And is this playoffs in Manhattan or Brooklyn? It's in Manhattan. Okay. Cool. It's going up at Theater Lab, which is on 36th Street in Manhattan. I'm just saying I think we're going to be in New York in March, so. Ah, amazing. Come see my play. Yeah, I think we're going to have to. Um, well, coming back to Baltimore, yes. if you don't mind, mm-hmm. um, you grew up here. I did. You went to St. Francis Assisi. St. Francis of Assisi. Of Assisi, sorry. Mm-hmm. And, and then Burnmar. Burnmar. Yes, mm-hmm. okay. Um, what was your childhood like here? Because you have parents who are both writers. Yes. And you have creative siblings. Yes. Yeah. So uh, my childhood here was great. It was very interesting. Um, You know, at St. Francis, it was a very warm community, like a very warm, loving, and surprisingly liberal community for a Catholic school. Well, St. Francis, I mean, Mm -hmm. besides like Jesus, was probably one of the first true liberals. Yeah, it's true. And so, and I also grew up in Mayfield, which is the neighborhood that St. Francis is in. And so... But then my parents were not the 
typical St. Francis parents. Like, they were divorced. I was one of three kids with divorced parents at St. Francis when I was going to school there. They were both artists, which is also, like, a little weird. Um, I'm sure anyone who knows my dad in Baltimore knows that he's quite a character. Uh, And so, yeah, I had sort of, like, a, a mix of this very, like, stable, warm, parochial community and then a very, like, eclectic rest of my childhood via my parents. I never thought about how we have that in common. Yeah. I never really... Have we ever talked about that? I don't know. Not that my family's artists, but Mm -hmm. the eclectic is a really lovely term to use. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But yeah, to have this, like, Catholic school experience and then a very different, like, different than all your peers' home experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, and it's kind of... It makes you feel a little bit like other in both and places. And being an other is sort of, I mean, it's hard when you're a kid, but it's a great place to come from as a writer. Mm-hmm. Because if you're always on the outside of something and never truly feeling like you fit in any of the communities, you have a great perspective on it. Yep. Even though it's like often hard to be a kid in that way as an adult, I yeah. think you can like appreciate it and probably why we both became writers. Yeah. Well, you're also looking, it's not your, mm, it's sort of like you're taking notes. You're like, oh, so like this is what we do here. Mm-hmm. And you think about it in this totally different way. And then when you're home, you're like, well, they don't do that here. Yeah. <laughs> here it's a little bit different. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, it was cool because I feel like because uh, my parents were in much different, like, social groups and, like, doing different things for work than a lot of my peers' parents, I got to see a lot of the city. Um, like, both me and my sister's first jobs, if you can even call them jobs, because I think I was in, like, elementary school, was like, do you remember that coffee shop Funk's? downtown we would like uh remember funks mike okay (laughs) so this other writer who's a friend of my dad's jen grow would like cook brunch at funks on the weekends before i even knew that brunch was like a thing in like the mid 90s and my sister and i would go help her out by like serving the drinks there Uh (laughs) um and yeah so that was yeah, you're just like in the in yeah. It. You're and my parents also had me and my siblings fairly young, and so we just would kind of like go with them on their like whatever they were doing. They just like brought us along. Mm-hmm. So we got and my dad was a Baltimore Sun reporter for the majority of my childhood, and he would either just like bring us to the newsroom with him, and my brother and I would just like play with the copy machine, which at the time I was like, oh yeah, my dad's work. But now being like an adult, I'm like, oh my God, if one of my colleagues just brought their three kids and we're like, here, play with the copy <laughs> machine. Like, photocopy your yeah. butt a million times. I'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> we did that too, actually. My, my dad's, he's a demolition company, yeah. but at the time um, the office was a trailer mm-hmm. in Whitehall. And we would go in and besides like the Playboys in the bathroom, which were a memory of mine i remember the copy machine and we would they'd be like yeah just play the copy machine for like three hours kids love a copy (laughs) machine i still have jake money that my brother made one day at the sun like i spent a whole afternoon making jake money with his face on it (laughs) Uh, or we'd just like go steal stuff from the supply closet uh or he would like sometimes when he didn't have a babysitter just drop us off at the enoch pratt downtown Really? And give my sister, who was the oldest, like five dollars, and be like, "Buy hot dogs." And then we, he'd be like, "You can't be bored. It's a library." That was his. So we would get dropped off at sports. Do you remember sports in Timonium? No. Oh my gosh, you don't remember sports? Do you remember sports, Mike? We were not a sports family. <gasps> okay, sports was this huge complex, um, and it's it was just like one huge room essentially, and it, the outside said, "Where summer never ends." And the inside was like half batting cages, half arcade. And I know that there are only two halves technically, but I'm going to say half (laughs) play gym. Oh, cool. And my dad would just be like, give us money and be like, all right, I'm going to go like hit baseballs for like two hours. And we would just be there. So much more independence for children in the 90s. So much more. Yeah. So much more independence. (laughs) We're very lucky that Mm -hmm. nothing bad happened. (laughs) Um, But you're right. You can't be bored in a library. Yeah. And we were not allowed to be. Just like the rule. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I think I I had a a very interesting childhood in Baltimore um, that I'm very appreciative of, although I remember at the time being a kid sometimes. I mean, my mom's house was very normal. My mom's house was very, like, Mm -hmm. kid-friendly. I probably shouldn't say this. My dad always gets mad when we say there were, like, no toys at his house, but there weren't. (laughs) (laughs) But I bet there were books. So many books. So many <laughs> Which books. Which are better than toys. I did a lot of writing at my dad's house. That's good. Um, 
Did you know forever that you wanted to be a playwright? Yes. Yes. I, yeah, actually, even specifically a playwright, I knew for a very long time. My first play I wrote in fourth grade at St. Francis, it was called Pretty Princess and the Seven Cockatoos. It was a take on Snow White. And Do you still have it? uh, My dad might have it somewhere. I don't still have it. I would run very rigorous rehearsals at recess to the point where once one of my friend's moms was like, recess is the time for you all to play, not to rehearse the play. (laughs) And I'd be like, sorry. Uh, Well, yeah, you have a deadline. (laughs) But both of my parents were writers, but neither of them were playwrights. And I always really loved performance. So I think even from like a super young age, I was like, oh, that's an area of writing that like I can claim. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I was thinking about it that consciously at the time, but I feel like I was like, oh, yes, I can be the playwright. And it's different than what my parents do, but like sure. also the same. But you also performed I did also plays. perform yeah. in plays so in high school. Yeah. Um, I was always in the Gilman musicals. But then I also wrote a Can you play. say? Uh, I, Jerry Broccolino, who was the Another great name. music oh teacher at St. Francis and did all of the, you know, Christmas plays and spring musicals, told us, just let your voice hit the clock in the back of the room. And that was, like, the only vocal training I really ever had. So I remember doing musicals at Gilman where there were, like, real singers. And my voice wasn't as good as anyone else's, but I was very loud. Like, you could always that hear a good me. Thing? <laughs> yeah. And I remember once they, they came up to us at an intermission and said, everyone needs to be louder. We can't hear anyone. And then the director came up to me and said, Fia, we're taking you off mic. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, well, I did what Jerry Broccolino told me to do. I let my voice hit the clock, but I wouldn't consider myself like okay. a good singer. I was just wondering. <laughs> I can't sing, so always Enough to curious. get cast. I okay. was good enough to get cast okay. in like good roles. Okay. Yeah. So in you, high school. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So you did you do straight plays in high school or just musicals? Um Yes, I also did straight plays, but I really preferred being in the musicals. But then for my senior project, I wrote and directed a straight play based on the poetry of Sylvia Plath, which is a very (laughs) kind of like pretentious thing for like an 18-year-old senior in high school to be doing. But I thought it turned out very well. (laughs) I was very, I was actually really proud of it when we did it. Um, That I don't know where it is. I haven't read it recently. I'm sure I would like, I would like to read cringe, but. I have very fond memories of it. I think it was like, I remember the design aspects of it and sort of like the overall theme of it and some of the, it sort of combined like dance in really sorry, cool ways. Dance in a Sylvia Plath? Oh, yeah. Play? But I had the girls in my class who were good dancers choreograph it and be the dancer. So the dance parts, I think. It was like a play with dance is what we would call it now in the theater world as opposed to like a play with music. Is there a video? Probably somewhere. But I'm sure the dialogue is like atrocious. Into the media trail of your life (laughs) after this. There's so much I didn't know. I feel like I've known you for a long time. Yeah. (laughs) But you didn't know about Blue Hours, my Sylvia Plath play. Blue Hours. A friend of mine was over last night um, who was, my friend Nina was the fig tree in my Sylvia Plath play and we were reminiscing about that. Was Morgan in it? No. No, okay. No, we couldn't ask. get Morgan on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's not her vibe. That's true. All right, fine. <laughs> Except for she loves to sing. All right. That's true. Sorry, Morgan, if you're listening. Um, so you then went to Bennington. Then I went to Bennington. Yep. Mm-hmm. And more plays, more everything. Yes. So I went to Bennington, and I studied literature and theater, which is very sort of, A, like straight for a Bennington major. You know, a lot of them are a little stranger and also very much like someone who wants to be a playwright that's what they would study is literature and theater Mm -hmm. and I did playwriting my first two years but then a the playwriting instructor who was like my mentor left but b Bennington only had 650 students when I went there including grad students are you serious yeah it's very small school it's it's a little bigger now I think they have like a thousand and so just everyone at Bennington eats dinner and lunch at the same time like, you eat lunch at noon and dinner at 5. Oh, my God. And all in Five? One, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's like you're at summer camp. Uh, <laughs> so everyone really knows everything about everyone else because you're in the middle of the woods. You're all eating dinner together at 5 p.m. That and is so weird. Cell phones didn't work when I went there. It was like the early to mid-aughts. And we had – by the time I left, you could use your cell phone on campus. But when I – my first two years, there was no signal. So everyone still used their room phones. 
And if you, like, went back to your room and the little red light was blinking, then you were like, oh, I have a message. And you would, like, call and it would tell you who called you. And everyone recorded their own voice at the beginning of this oh term. Oh, my God. So you'd be like, did the guy, like, call me? And it then sounds like, like, like a 70s, his... like, I know, women's but it college. was 2003. <laughs> it's so crazy. But, yeah, it was very old school in that way. But so anyway, writing at Bennington I found to just be a little too revealing. Like, you revealed enough of yourself just by being a student on that campus. Mm -hmm. You didn't need people to then read whatever you were writing and be like, oh, well, we know everywhere where this is coming from because we have no entertainment except each other's lives. So I started doing a lot of directing at Bennington and a lot of costume design. And so directed a Maria Irene Fornes play, Mud, for my thesis, and then would like do a fashion show most semesters and design for plays. But then as soon as I graduated and moved to New York, I was like, well, but I really want to be a playwright. Like, that's what I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then do you feel like screenwriting is, like, I mean, how did you get to screenwriting? Do you feel like that's a totally separate career, or do you feel like it's... Well, I got to screenwriting because the only kind of writing you can make less money in than a playwright is as a poet. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's like poetry and then playwriting. (laughs) Okay. And so if I want it... So... Uh, When I first moved to New York, I didn't feel like I could just write and then work sort of like straight up money jobs like nannying and waitressing, which is what I did later. I felt like I needed to establish myself in the city and have like a real job or like a grown up job. Um, And so first I worked in the Blue Men Group costume shop, which was a lot of washing blue paint out of black jumpsuits. It's like the majority of what you did in the Blue Man Group costume show. Imagine what else you thought it would be (laughs) when you took that job. Uh, And then I ended up working at CAA, which is where I met Nicola, who I started BTP with. And then after I left CAA, well, while I was at CAA, I was like, I don't want to be an agent. But it was like a a good crash course in like the business of theater, whereas Mm -hmm. Bennington was super ephemeral and like, just be an artist. CIA was like, this is a business. (laughs) Like, this is how much you make working on Broadway. Like, this is how many seats a Broadway house has. You learned something. This is what people care about. Yeah, I learned. Well, I learned a lot of Bennington, but then I learned a whole different thing working at CAA. But I was like, I also don't want to be on this side of it. I want to be on the artist side. So I just applied to whatever I could apply to that had an open right open submissions. And then in like a stroke of very good luck, uh, when I left, well, I was thinking if I go to grad school, that's a way to leave CAA and not burn these bridges and be like, I'm leaving to be a playwright. And I got into grad school. So you guys should not forget about me. Uh, So I applied to Juilliard because it was in New York and it was free. And I was like, I don't want to go into debt for being a playwright because I already have undergrad debt. This is a really dumb question. Is Juilliard free to everyone? No, just the playwrights. Oh, just really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. I feel like I've said that 14 times in this interview. I did not know that. Just the playwrights. So that's why I applied to Juilliard. Um, And then I asked my boss to write my recommendation, which was like a cheeky way of me asking him to read my play without having to like (laughs) ask him to read my play. (laughs) But while I was waiting to hear if I got into Juilliard, I found out that I'd gotten into the Royal Court Young Writers Program in London, which is like a playwriting group run out of that theater in London. So... The fact that I got into those two things so quickly was, like, very lucky for me to be what I was leaving CAA for because then they were like, oh, well, we shouldn't let you get too far away. Right. Um, And then they ended up being my first agency, and I got my first television job through them at, like, a couple of years after grad school. But when I came back from London to go to Juilliard, I was like, okay, now that I've established that I am a playwright, I can just start nannying and waitressing because I feel like (laughs) I've moved to New York. I had a real job. Like, I understand the city a little bit better. And now, like, I can just be serious about writing and I can... Would you recommend that course of action to people graduating right now who are considering... I think if you have a little bit of a different personality than I do, you could just start working a money job right away and, like, self-producing and, like acting and things that pay you no money and like just sort of like getting the lay of the land that way Mm -hmm. I think whatever you can do to get the lay of the artistic landscape wherever you are you should do but just knowing myself I think I would feel too at sea doing that and I needed like a more direct entry into the community to feel like okay I have this job that is like in the industry, but I think the trap of doing it the way I did was sometimes you don't end up leaving to do the art 
Interesting. Like sometimes yeah. you get in on the business side and yeah. you're like, well, I'm in the industry I wanted to work in. And, and I'm like, and if you're doing well, you can continue to like rise the ranks on the business side. And then all of a sudden you wake up 10 years later and you're like, I'm an agent. How did that happen? I wanted to be a writer. So I think if you do it the way I did, but you really want to still be an artist, you can't stay longer than two years in any of those. And you need a pit stop at graduate school, yeah. pit stop as a nanny, and then <laughs> keep going. Well, you can do the graduate school nanny pit stop together. Yeah. <laughs> well, didn't you end up actually writing yeah, about the, being a nanny? The, a show? Yeah. My yeah. first thing I ever sold in television was a TV show called Brooklyn Nannies that was about my experience being a nanny in Brooklyn, um, which is a show that I wrote because I was like perfectly fine nannying while in grad school. Then I graduated and I didn't have any other work and I was like a nanny who wasn't in grad school <laughs> and I was like I'm kind of just feeling like like this is just what I'm doing this now. is just what I'm yeah. doing like when people when I see people at a party and they're like what do you do I can say like, like I oh. have a reading of a play <laughs> but then they'd be like what do you, what do you really do and be like I I'm a nanny I am. <laughs> and I just started to feel really like oh, I need to like make something happen I'm feeling like I'm getting older and I need more of a like professional career but I want to still be an artist. So I bought a one-way ticket to L.A. and was like, I'm just not coming back to New York until, like, something happens. Were you dating Adam at this point? I was dating Adam at that point. And he was just... Yeah, yeah. he was like... the best. He was like, go. Yeah. (laughs) Can we talk a little more about Baltimore? Yes. Okay. I'd love to talk about Baltimore. Um, Well, then we'll start now so we don't have that weird intro (laughs) (laughs) that I just created. Um... So how often do you come back to Baltimore? I So since both of my parents are here, and I'm very lucky to still have three living grandparents, they're all here. And the majority of my aunts, basically my whole family is here except my siblings. So we come down at least three times a year, I would say, but sometimes even a little more than that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for like Christmas and my dad has a chorizo festival at his house every year. Oh, that's right. So we always come for the Fiesta de Chorizo. Um and, yeah, we'll probably come one other time usually. Mm-hmm. Does your husband like it down here? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah. He's a honorary Baltimorean. And actually, he – we met in New York, and he's from Rochester, <laughs> but he has a ton of friends from Baltimore who I didn't know. So at our wedding, neither of us went to park school, but there was a whole park school table. <laughs> I was at your wedding, and I don't yeah. remember that. A lot of park – well, because you weren't at the park school. Table. <laughs> oh, right. Sure. Okay. <laughs> a lot of park school kids live in um, Brooklyn. And a lot of my good friends from Baltimore went there because I worked with at the Charles when I was in high school. That's right. You worked at the Charles. And met a lot of really good friends there. You were originally going to get married there. I was, yeah. but then our wedding ended up being too big to do there. Sure. It would have been the perfect place to have, like, an intimate – 70 person wedding but mm-hmm. my husband has like 40 first cousins so that was just not going to be no our wedding but we got married at Silburn Arboretum which is very beautiful it was so beautiful mm-hmm. and it was really rainy mm-hmm. which was kind of super beautiful winter wedding a win- well, bear trees March yeah March yeah That's I remember winter, being right? green it wasn't green was it no everything was very like gothic I was pretty and drunk. all the trees were- <laughs> sorry <laughs> I think a lot of people were pretty drunk. It was wedding. a really fun wedding. Yeah. I mean, people definitely drank. DJ Baby Eagle from Philly was the, <laughs> was the DJ who we found because we had been in Baltimore for Christmas, the Christmas before we got married, and we were at a spank rock show at Metro Gallery. Yeah. And then... That all adds up. Yeah. <laughs> DJ Baby Eagle was one of his DJs, and we were like, this guy's great. And we are like, maybe he wanted to DJ our wedding, and he did. So that's sure. great. Yeah. Yeah. It was super fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We did dance a lot. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That was a nice night. Um, do, so do you follow the art scene in Baltimore besides stalking DJs? <laughs> I do. Um, like, I really love Erin Fostel's drawings. She's a Baltimore artist. And then I still have so many friends who live here that I feel like I often, A, know about the art scene from my parents because they're both very involved still in the Baltimore art scene. So I'll come down when my dad has readings or my mom used to run the New Mercury reading series. And then, you know, just through other friends, we find out about things. But also, I know so many people who either work for the city or are involved in Baltimore city politics that I often find I know more about Baltimore city politics than I do about New York city politics. (laughs) 
Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is so strange. I lived in New York for 11 years, and I know more about Baltimore still in terms of, like, the minutia of City (laughs) Hall. (laughs) That's good you stay in touch in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I typically ask five questions Mm -hmm. at the end of my podcast, so I'm assuming you can answer most of these because... Okay. Like, and it... I'll Are they Baltimore focused? <laughs> yeah, they're all Baltimore okay. questions. So I'll give you this like little tri- or leeway. Got it. If you want to answer when you lived here. Okay. If you don't have like a current answer, that's okay. fine. I can do that. Okay. So where is your favorite place to eat or have dinner? Those so, are two different things. Where's we Okay, what I ask is, where's your favorite place to have dinner? Where's my favorite place to have dinner? Well, I grew up mm-hmm. in Mayfield and Arcadia, so... I feel like we were eating the Coco's crab cake before everyone started saying it was the best crab cake in Baltimore. I've known from a child that was the best crab cake in Baltimore. <laughs> so much better than the rest of us, but yeah. <laughs> but you are right. It's a really good crab cake. It's a crab really cake. good crab cake. Yeah. Um, and so that's like a neighborhood spot. Um, I also really love Maggie's Farm, which is another Hamilton restaurant. My mom lives in Hamilton now, so all of those like – Hamilton restaurants we go to a lot. I'm very sad Clementine is closed. I know. They catered my wedding, and we just always really loved Clementine. We would always go there when I came home, so it's sad to me they're not around anymore. So Um, that was three. Quick aside, you say my wedding, which is what I say, and Rob gets so mad. He says he say our wedding? Yeah, does Adam ever? But Adam's not sitting next to me. If he was sitting next to me, I would say our wedding. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. He's he's like three and a half hours away. So it was just your wedding, right? (laughs) Um, where's your favorite place to get a drink in Baltimore? Uh, well, when I worked at the Charles, when I was still very much underage, I feel like the first bar that I ever really went to was uh, my friends would sneak me into the Club Charles, and it was so fun. And that's the first bar I ever really went to. Like That's a really good first bar. So I'm going to say the Club Charles, even though I haven't been there in probably years. Now that you can legally drink. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where is your favorite place to buy a gift? I'm going to say a neighborhood, which is a, if I have to buy a gift, I'll usually go to Hamden. Although I'm very sad that all the antique stores are closed because when I moved to New York, this isn't really a gift, but I got all of my furniture from my New York apartment in those oh, old really? antique stores in Hamden. Some but are still open. Some of them, but like not David's and not the big one that was in the five and dime and but I will. Oh God, that one was so yeah, good. Yeah, it was so cool. Uh, but I I'll, forgot that. I'll go to Hamden for gifts. Yeah, yeah. I forgot. I forgot about that um, antique shop. Okay, where is your favorite place to be outside? Uh, Sherwood Gardens. It's a good one. We did our family photo shoot there. Did I send you? Yeah. Okay. I love your Christmas card. And Lou took. He peed his pants and then took them off and wouldn't. Which I mean, obviously he took them off, but. Wouldn't let me put his new pair of pants back on. And so he, all of our, like, Christmas photos, are, or holiday photos, um, are just his, like, bare ass running around oh, Sherwood Gardens. Cute. But it's, like, a really nice neighborhood. And my yeah. child's, like, butt was just <laughs> in front of everybody for, I mean, really, like, two hours. And luckily no one said anything. But I actually haven't been to Sherwood Gardens in, like, five years, though. So maybe I should change my answer to Lake Montebello, where I consistently walk around the lake when I'm home with my mom. Okay. But right. both. I like them both. All right. We'll take both. Um, and then who is your favorite? We kind of already answered this. Your favorite artist or author? Or I should say art, artist and or author. Artist and or. So, um, yeah, I already I already said Erin. And I feel bad because I'm forgetting her name. But Erin Fostal just did a collaboration with another Baltimore artist that I just saw on Instagram. I was just going to ask if she has an Instagram. Yeah, that I really loved. But I don't know that artist's name. I wish I did so I could talk about her. Do you know Aaron's Instagram? I think it's just Aaron Fustel. Okay. And then I feel like author, I should say my parents. Sure. Deborah Rudisil <laughs> and Rafael Alvarez. <laughs> sure. What kind of writing does your mom do? My mom is a science writer and a historian. So she wrote the book Roots of Steel that was about the closing of Bethlehem Steel and sort of the disappearance of the working class in Baltimore. And then she also wrote this book, The Riddle of Gender, which is in 2001, she interviewed every prominent transgender person in America. And wrote. so she was very ahead of her time on both of those books. And then right now she is writing a book about how addiction affects the whole family, not just the addict. Wow. Mm -hmm. What a woman. Yeah. What a writer. And then she's a professor at UMBC. 
that's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. And then do you want to say what your dad's working on? So my dad had a new book of short stories come out last year. And then I believe he's working on a novel, but I don't know the name of it. Very cool. And then what about your siblings? We'll just go through the family, given my- you're all just <laughs> fabulous artists. My sister is an actress and a fashion blogger and a writer. So she had a web series that came out last year about her experience being a fashion blogger. I watched That she it. starred in. Mm-hmm. And then my brother is a chemical engineer and a cartoonist. And he wrote – he d- puts comics out every week on – his website, hypnospiralcomics.com. But then he wrote a graphic novel a couple of years ago called Chinatown Bus that's really good about him or someone going up from Philly to New York on the Chinatown bus to visit a girlfriend that's, I think, really good. And he's working on a new graphic novel right now. You guys are like the Royal Tenenbaums of Baltimore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on here. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you, Fia. It's worth noting that as soon as we ended the interview, she realized that she gave not the entire answer for her favorite place to go to dinner. Samos is apparently the Alvarez family dinner spot. So just wanted to get that out and make sure everybody knew. You can find Fia on Instagram at Bird Abroad. And if you happen to have a couple extra Bitcoin lying around, check out her innovative production company, BT Project. uh, And you can find the link to that in her Instagram profile. For past Hate Baltimore episodes and all the cool stuff happening downtown, go to our site, godowntownbaltimore.com. Hey Baltimore is produced by Mike Evitz and made possible by Downtown Partnership. Our theme music is Artificial Sin by Super City, and I'm your host, Megan Eisenach. If you want to reach out, email us at heybaltimore at dpob.org, and thank you for listening. (laughs) 